What's your thoughts on energy balance? So energy balance, I think, basically refers to essentially calories in versus calories out. So primarily it, it references obviously weight control, so weight loss, weight maintenance, weight gain. So I guess people think about calories when they think about weight. So a calorie is basically uh, a simple unit to measure energy. Um, so that's when we talk about energy balance, we're basically talking about calories. So we're talking about ca calorie balance, essentially. Um, and I guess it goes back to the first law of thermodynamics. So it's this, uh, this law that basically means that energy, it can be created or destroyed. It can only be transferred. Um, so essentially it's this principle that if you want to maintain your weight, you need to basically consume the amount of calories that your body is burning to maintain in an equal measure. If you want to gain weight, then you basically need to eat in a surplus. You need to eat more calories than your body, body is burning. And if you want to lose weight, you need to eat in a calorie deficit. So that is essentially, in a, in a nutshell, energy balance. How many people don't even know what a calorie is? I bet there's loads. When you speak to them about a calorie, I bet they don't even know what that is. It's really good, mate. It's really good. Yeah, you're probably right, mate. And um, I think people will probably know the, the word. Yeah, they'll know what a calorie is. So they'll know it's a uh, measurement of unit that they that's uh, to do with food. And they know that they're allowed between 2,000 <clears throat> and 2,400 a day, depending on their size, because they see it on a packet. But they probably don't know anything about their basal metabolic rate. They probably don't know, you know, exactly how many calories they should have a day. Yeah, 100%. So I guess it would be helpful if we explain very quickly as well that obviously within particular types of food, you get different amounts of calories. So we won't get too much into this today because it's probably a topic for another day, but obviously macronutrients, so they're the kind of large components of our food and what they're made up of. Um, and you've basically got protein, you've got fats, and you've got carbohydrates. Now, in a gram of, of protein and a gram of carbs, you've got four calories, whereas fat, you've got nine calories per, per gram. And that's why previously like fat's been a bit demonized in regard to weight weight control because it basically has over two times the amount of calories per gram versus the other components that's why a bag of nuts people <laughs> <laughs> it's an easy way to put on fucking weight yeah and and this is it you know we're not talking necessarily about the you know the sort of quality of calories yeah. here just that energy in energy out and yeah that's all it is yeah and you know when we talk about weight control there's you know there's lots of little nuances and, and lots of arguments in regard to kind of what contributes to weight and you know, there's a lot of people trying to sell books and, you know, everything else. So people complicate the matter, but fundamentally it really does come down to energy balance. So that's kind of where the energy comes from. So it's obviously consumption of food, um, not from th thin air, um, you know, which is probably going to break the hearts of some people. You know, if you're putting on fat, we're not talking about weight necessarily because weight can fluctuate with things like hydration, um, you know, and whether you, you know, you've had a shit or not. Um, so we're not talking necessarily about weight, but if you're putting on fat, which is normally represented on the scales by like a prolonged, consistent weight gain over a period of time, you can probably assume that that's going to be a level of fat. We're talking about sort of, yeah, fat gain. So to, be in, to gain fat, you need to be overeating yeah. the amount of calories that you're burning. Well, yeah, that's, that's, that's the main thing, isn't it? If you want to lose weight, you've got to be in a calorie deficit. It's as simple as that. So with, with that and with energy balance, like when when you're when you're in a calorie calorie deficit and you want to lose weight one of the easiest things to do is is track your food and and what you do for that yeah so i guess there's a there's a couple of different like methods to dieting um i guess the thing to maybe cover off first is like everyday energy expenditure just to sort of i guess give people the full information around obviously consumption and expenditure and then we can look at different strategies so tracking is definitely one of them um but you've obviously got total daily energy expenditure right people might see that as t-d-e-e -E, if you see it on a on some sort of fucking fitness book or something yeah and people will also be familiar with bmr mm -hmm. which is basal which means base metabolic rate so that, simply put, is the amount of calories that you burn to basically keep the lights on. So it's the calories that you burn for vital function. So if you're laid in bed, not moving, your basal metabolic rate is the amount of calories. And just to clarify, it's different from BMI. The amount of clients <laughs> I've said to people about their basal metabolic rate, and they've gone, 
well, BMI says it's all right. I'm like, no, 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 something different. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's a common uh, common mistake that people make for sure. Um, so yeah, so uh, so basal metabolic rate, so BMR. Um, and that's not your total daily energy expenditure. That's that's probably one of like four things that, that really contribute to it. It probably makes up maybe like 70 to 80% of your total calorie expenditure. And it will be different depending on the size of the person. Mm -hmm. Now, not necessarily the... Uh, the kind of fat mass of a person with the lean mass. Yeah. So the amount of muscle they've got on their body because that requires energy to maintain. So if someone has a lot of muscle mass, then their BMI will typically be higher than somebody has who has low muscle mass, which is why I actually like sort of weight training and- Yeah, yeah. persistent training is good. Yeah, that can help with, with fat control as well. So that's one component. Then you've got NEAT. Um, so that's non-exercise activity thermogenesis. Um, so this is like, an interesting one because this is so essentially it's kind of fidgeting you know I'm, an, I'm a nightmare for it so i always like my knees always on the go I, I used to rock a lot for some reason i don't know why i've noticed myself we've been doing it on this podcast a couple of times <laughs> um but yeah it's, it's typically like little movements fidgeting yeah. um some people will also reference like walking um as as neat and it kind of it kind of is and isn't because it's non-exercise activity thermogenesis so if you're purposely going out for a walk to get some exercise that's not neat that's that's exercise but if you're just moving about doing your activities of everyday living that's what i was about to say so like i would say if you're at work work you know up and around the desk moving whatever that's neat if you're actively going out and walking that's not neat you know what i mean that's something a little bit different that's counting your steps and we could talk about that on a different day but as paul said your neat is um you could be quite aware of it. Aware of it, you you said to me, I'm, I'm quite still. When I, <laughs> it's fucking <laughs> quite an understatement, mate. <laughs> and uh, and um, it's only because he said it when he was uh, editing, and I looked at it and I thought, fuck me, I didn't move for like two minutes. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, it is it is so important, and it when you when you become consciously aware of that, you can pick up and you can actively move a little bit more. Um, even just little things like just going up and doing the dishes and trying to be a bit more active and going up the stairs. Like I just got back from holiday and consciously I, I went up the stairs every day, you know, I didn't take a lift, just went up the stairs. And again, that's, is that exercise? Is it not? Yeah, of course it is. But that's, that comes underneath because I, I have to go up there, but I'm choosing a better option. So, so that, as you say, mate, is really important. It probably makes up about 20%. It's a huge amount, really, isn't it? Yeah, of your total daily energy expenditure. And that's going to vary again. Again, like you sat here for an hour and a half on a podcast, barely moving at all, versus me fidgeting the whole time. Yeah, yeah. Um, then that's going to obviously have a difference. And that's typically something that you see as well when people talk about like metabolic adaptation or like starvation mode, where you put yourself in a big deficit and you kind of stop losing weight. Often it's because your neat crashes. So your body will stop like those little uh, subconscious movements that you do in, in order to preserve energy because it's aware that you're, you know, you're in a very low uh, calorie intake. So sometimes when people are in a deficit and they stop losing weight, sometimes it's because they've dieted out of the deficit and obviously their BMR has changed and lowered and that's why they're not losing weight. But often it's because their knee is, is crashed. So if you are in a low calorie diet, and again, we'll touch on this a little bit more in a second. Um, be mindful of your neat because I know when I go into a big deficit, if I'm aggressively dieting for a period of time, I'm aware that I suddenly just stop moving and I just kind of slump into my chair and stop fidgeting as much. And that's where I need to be a bit more mindful about my exercise and my activity. So that's neat. And yeah, about 20%. Um, and then you've got the, the TEF, which is the thermic effect of food. Um, so that's probably about 10%. So good news is that eating does burn calories. Um, and this is typically where you get some of these people who will say that calories don't matter because they're not made equal. And they're not made equal where they do matter because again, sort of fundamentally, like the energy balance matters. Like if yeah, you're in a deficit, you'll lose weight. If you're in a surplus, you'll put on weight. That's still the case. But they are right in the sense that if you're consuming fat, then the thermic effect of eating fat is very low. So you don't burn a lot of calories. So you're going to pretty much like absorb, if you if you like, 100% of those calories near enough. Whereas things like sort of more complex carbohydrates, fibrous carbohydrates, proteins, they're a little bit more difficult and require a few more calories to burn down. 
So if you eat 100 calories of, of protein, you're not going to then take on 100 calories. You're going to take on less because you need to expend energy to, to actually digest it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's where, again, you know, people kind of muddy the waters with energy balance a little bit because they talk about the effect of food. Yeah. And I think at the end of the day, the calorie, the calorie system works. Look at any bodybuilder who's, who's cutting for a show, watching all their calories. It's, it, it works, you know. Um. Yeah, it definitely does. Um, and then finally, you've obviously got eat, which um, is nothing to do with eating. Um, it's actually the, um, it's the basic exercise activity thermogenesis. So uh, unlike NEAT, it's not non-exercise. This is specific exercise. So like you said earlier, mate, purposely going out for a walk, going to the gym, going for a run, that's the energy that you burn doing exercise. Now you've heard the term you can't outrun a, or you can't outwork a bad diet, right? And that's because that probably only accounts for about five to 10% of your total daily energy expenditure. Um, now, obviously, if you do no exercise versus ultra marathons, that's going to be probably different. But on average, like five or ten percent, um, and I'd argue that a lot of the UK, at the very least, and probably the states as well, is certainly more towards five percent because yeah. I don't think many people are doing much physical activity, like we talked about in our last episode around this stuff. So that's total daily energy expenditure um, and all its various components. So you mentioned obviously about dieting strategies, right? So we'll come on to tracking in a second because that's one of three that I think about. So you've basically got the methods of, of dieting, really. You've got dietary restriction. So that is essentially where you look to uh, restrict a particular food group. So veganism, um, where you're sort of restricting animal products, carnivore, where you're, you're restricting carbohydrates. Um, so that's kind of dietary restriction. Then you've got time restrict time restriction which is fasting protocols or kind of eating windows. So for example, like 16, eight, five, two. Um, and then finally you've got calorie restriction where you have to physically track your calories. So back to your earlier question around how I track my calories. So, so this is like a method that I use primarily. So I've, I've used all of those different things. I've done carnival where I restricted carbohydrates and lost weight. I was eating less, but the sport that we do in jujitsu, I found it just didn't give me the energy that I needed for that. Um, I've done done eating windows, um, so I typically I, I almost do by by default. In a way, I often won't eat till like eleven o'clock in the morning, maybe midday, um, and often we'll stop eating at about ten. So it's not quite like a sixteen eight, but there's definitely a, a fasting period. Um, but again, that just reduces the amount of time in which you can consume calories, and then it's tracking. Um, tracking is what I typically do at the moment. Um, I use apps. So I think like, um, not that we're sponsored by this one, but my fitness pal was one that I've used for many years. It was, I think one of the first, um, there is a barcode scanner, which if you've got like a legacy account is free, but I think you now have to pay for that, which is a bit disappointing because that's really like, that's a game changer. Isn't it? Yeah. hundred percent. Um, so I use my fitness pal, but there's other apps that are similar where you can scan barcodes um, and obviously get an understanding of what you're eating. And I think if people are listening and they've not used that sort of app, they should because you will be absolutely horrified by the amount of calories that you're consuming in certain foods. And I'll say on that as well, when you're counting your calories, really take the time to weigh your food out. Don't just willy-nilly, you know, make yourself a chicken wrap and think, oh, estimate that's that's 150 grams of chicken when really you're putting 300 in there. Um, and then between brands as well, there's big difference in calories. That's a big thing I'd say. One wrap from Sainsbury's is not the same from Asda. Um, you know, 20 or 30 calories, you think it's not a lot of calories. But if you're having that two wraps a day and then you have that for seven days a week, it's a huge amount of calories at the end of the week that you're just unaware that you're having. Then you're wondering why you're not losing weight. Yeah, and this is the thing with... with with sort of calorie restriction. I mean, you know, you can you can like overshoot your, your, your kind of plan with it and, and go for like a big deficit and you'll probably potentially fall short of that but still come in in a deficit. But it really comes down to how quickly you want to lose weight. Um, now, a lot of people have this idea in their head that if you aggressively diet, then you put all the weight back on. And, you know, there's certainly been some studies that have shown that, but others that have shown the opposite. It, sometimes it's about 
you know, kind of having that aggressive period of dieting, but then still controlling your intake of calories on the back end of it, where you kind of reverse diet it to like maintenance. Yeah, reverse dieting is so important. If you go low on your calories and then just jump straight back up, yeah, you will put a bit of weight back on. But if you can gradually then increase your calories back up, you'll keep the weight off. It's as simple as that because your body will get used to the metabolism. Yeah, hundred percent. So, um, so I think that's really important. So you can aggressively diet, and that's typically my preference. So you can almost like go hard. So I could aggressively diet for maybe I don't know two, three weeks, and then have like a maintenance week, and then go hard again for three weeks, have a maintenance week, and that's quite a nice style of doing it um, because I I can't think of anything worse than having to diet for like six to twelve months and just living a restricted lifestyle yeah. for that period. Um, but the, the reality is that the way that we live these days with how convenient and you know sort of calorie dense food is and how inactive we are, you have to sacrifice. You have to be willing to not eat certain foods and put a bit of effort into knowing what you're eating. And I think this is what you know, we were saying a second ago about just mindlessly kind of picking things up and not tracking. And that that's really the kind of make or break with with calorie restriction. And this is why some people like take to it and some don't, because you've almost got to have quite a like analytical mind to really be able to to kind of collect that data around what you're eating and use it as data and understand that if you're not losing weight, then it's potentially most almost certainly because you've miscalculated something. And this is a bit where people get emotional about it, where you know, we'll work with clients and we'll say, Well, you're not losing weight what are you eating? They'll tell us. And you say, well, that doesn't add up. Um, so you must be like eating more. And they're like, I'm, I'm not a liar. I'm not lying. Yeah. It's, like, well, it's not always that you're not lying, but sometimes you can miscalculate stuff. Because like you say, like even if you're, and this is the danger, that even if you're using barcode scanning, those labels can still be up by 20%. So if you've got a small deficit and you are the sort of person who's happy doing a marathon type diet, where you just go on a little restriction, a little deficit over a long period, and it's like a 20% deficit, like you could be just in no deficit because actually the what you're eating, if it's, you know, if it's... Slight packaging. calculation. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's no fault of your own. And, and the other thing as well is if you're, if you're dieting and restricting calories six days of the week and you're in, I don't know, let's say a 200 calorie deficit, so by the end of the week, you've, so that's like six days. 1,200 calories. 1,200 calories, thanks mate. That's right, mate. I was gonna struggle there. And then on a Sunday, you go out and you have a pizza yeah. and you sink, you know, 10 beers and then have like a, a, a tub of ice cream. Like it's you, all gone. Yeah. And more. Yeah. It's all gone. All that hard work, all that, I say it all the time to my clients. Yeah. Got quite a funny uh, story actually from a few weeks ago where, um, I train a couple and one's a postman and the other one's got a sedentary job. And they're one, one, one of my clients is a female and she's about 11 stone and the male client's about 12 and a half stone. I've got them on a really, they, they, they eat the same food basically. Slight difference in calories. We, he wanted to aggressively like diet. She didn't, she's like down there. She's happy. Anyway, so on the same food, basically by about 200 calories, but he he does 30,000 steps a day. So <laughs> there was a two week period where we was weighing him, right? And he had put on three pounds and she had lost four on the same diet, right? So then I was like, so we're coming back to that point of like like doing your food and stuff like that. And uh, same sort of thing. I said to him, hey, science. I was like, it, it doesn't add up. There's no way that this can add up. Like she's lost four pound on the same diet as you. And um, he just laughed. And then it turns out that she he, she was like doing the food for her, but she wasn't doing one of his meals. And he was he was counting out his chicken wrong. And he was adding um, two pieces of fruit. But he was like, oh, it's not going to make much of a difference. But he was adding two pieces of fruit on top of what he was eating. And then he didn't tell me as well. He, he had like four days off work. So then his neat was zero. I said, what do you do in those four days? He said, mate, I didn't get out of bed. <laughs> do you know what I mean? So, yeah. and then, but his first reaction was, "I'm not, I'm not lying, I'm not lying," and he, he didn't, he didn't, he actually was sticking to his diet, but he put on weight because he was so active because he does twenty seven, thirty thousand steps a day. Went from that to doing none. He, I said, "Let's have a look at your watch." On those days, he was doing like a thousand steps. He literally done nothing.
Yeah, it, it yeah, it's made it's a really good example because it makes such a difference. And you see it a lot. Like my, my dad was the same, and I've got mates that have been the same as well, where they've been active in a job or in sport, they have like a particular intake of calories. They for whatever reason, injury, Bit of health. Me. Yeah, stop, basically stop the activity, but maintain the same intake. So their expenditure goes down, their intake maintains and suddenly they balloon in weight. It's so easily done. So many sports people do it. It's so yeah. easily done because you're used to that lifestyle. You used to being able to eat two and a half, three thousand calories. So you, I was, I was always lucky where I didn't even have to worry about it really. I never because I was playing football five, six days a week. So if I wanted to eat whatever, I was like, yeah, so I'm burning it off every night, you know. Yeah. As soon as I had some bad injuries and I couldn't train as much, and then I was out for eight months, and I come back and I was out again. Yeah, I was, I, I ballooned. I went up to like eight and a half stone, and I was like, that was really quick as well. That was like over a, a year period. I went from probably thirteen stone to about eighteen and a half. Yeah, and that, and it wasn't even like. It, I don't know. You f it, that sounds like such an extreme thing, but yeah, I was lifting weights, but I, I was I was just not getting any any more running in. I wasn't doing any more expenditure. Yeah, you know? and I was just being really lazy. Yeah, and that's it. And you know, food's nice. Food's nice, oh, man. man. You know, I mean, it's, it's it's really easy to overeat. But even if you're like purposely being mindful, like again, you know, if you're adding, you know, sort of oils and sauces, like you know, like olive oil. We've talked about this before, right? So. Olive oil per meal, that's a gram. So a meal is a gram. So what did we say earlier that a gram is nine calories? So if you're sprinkling like even a teaspoon, which is like 10 mil, like into your food, like suddenly you're just adding like 90 calories to it. Well, the first thing I say to all my clients, no, no oils. And yeah. they look at me, they're like, well, no, it's good for you. And I'm like, I'm not saying it's not good for you. I'm not getting into any of that. It's the calories. It's the calories that's in it. We're trying to lose weight, so we want to cut out as many calories as we can from the things that are not going to really make much of a difference. That's the way I look at it. You know, just... Yeah, or, like, have it, but you have to, like, measure it. And it, it depends how precise you want to be with that shit. Well, that, no, but as well, though, it, you know, if like you said, if a teaspoon is 90 calories, if, if they want two teaspoons for it to even make a difference, I always say, would you rather have that or would you rather 100 grams of chicken breast? And if you ask me, I'd have the 100 grams of chicken breast. And this is the other thing as well, which, um, you know, we haven't touched on really too much in this discussion. But again, we will at some point, certainly if we talk about like sort of gaining muscle and that type of thing. But, you know, that if you want to hold on to your muscle, you need to have a certain amount of protein. Um, you really do. And obviously, if you're then doing sort of activity where you're doing a higher intensity activity and maybe lifting heavy weights, you need like carbohydrates really to fuel that. So really that only leaves fat that you you have to restrict and you still want to have fat in your diet. You know, it's still important, but you can supplement with obviously cod liver oil and, and those type of things to just, you know, replace it some way. But it's the amount of calories, you know, and, you know, historically I've always gone a high protein, like high fat, low carb diet. Um, and I've switched to higher carb recently and I found I got way more energy doing that. But I can't, I, you can't do both. You can't do both. And what you do find though is with, with high protein and also like fibrous carbs is they're quite satiating. So if you are on a restrictive calorie intake, obviously hunger is going to like chase you down. And, you know, eventually if you don't manage that hunger, it, you're going to fall foul to it like you will. So if you eat like satiating foods yeah. that fill you up and make you feel full, then that's going to support with obviously maintaining a low calorie diet as well. Yeah, 100%, mate. And, uh, I think if you enjoy your food while you're dieting, I think that's the main thing. I think if you're go going to put yourself as well on on really stupid restrictive diets that you can stick to for maybe four or five days and then never go back to, and then when you do make that mistake, you go, oh, fuck it, I'm not doing it. You've got to make the food that you're eating st something that you can keep to. I think that's the biggest thing. It's, uh, I think you said it to me ye probably years ago now. You said it's um, you can have the best diet in the world, but if you're not going to adhere to it, it doesn't fucking matter. Yeah, it's like anything, mate. It's true, yeah. you know. It's it's exactly that, you know. Uh, me, me, and Paul, and probably fucking thousands of other PTs could could write uh, the most perfect plan for a human <laughs> to to consume. You know, the most balanced, perfect meal plan ever. But if you then don't ever want to eat it, then you're not going to keep to it. So it's no fucking point in doing it. Yeah. So tr me, tracking's tracking's a t it's a tricky one um, because if you want to be really precise with it, it takes some effort. And not everybody has the time, you know, the bandwidth, you know, the the kind of, uh, you know, mental real estate to do that. So obviously we mentioned like the dietary restrictions. I don't like them as such. And, and veganism, I think typically is more of a moral thing. Um, 
yeah, I think, you know, that diet has a lot of flaws in regards to nutrition. Um, and obviously carnivore, again, you know, there's, there's a few that argue it does work well and, and I'd love to see some studies in 10 years or someone on it for 10 years and yeah. see some real good studies on that because yeah, yeah. it is fascinating. Yeah. I mean, to, to be fair, like the one macronutrient that you can like literally do without is carbohydrates because mm -hmm. your body will make it. Like, yeah. You don't you, need it. Yeah. yeah. Like, you know, you've got gluconeogenesis, which is where your body through the liver converts other foods into, into glucose. Whereas if you don't eat protein, you're going to die. If you don't eat fat, you're going to die. So... You have to have those in your diet, um, where you don't, you know, if you don't have carbs, you'll be, you'll be okay. You might be tired, but you'll be okay. And then your body does switch over. You yes. know, it does start producing ketones and it does make you feel better over time. That's why people, some people feel great on a carnivore diet or a ketogenic diet. That's why, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Um, but I think the, the issue with that is it quickly switches back if you then start eating carbs. Yeah, that, well, you have to go all in. This yeah, is what exactly. I say to my clients. So I had a client uh, consultation today. And uh, we were talking and he, he basically was saying that he wanted to switch over to the carnivore. And I, where he's at at the moment, he still needs to gain some weight and bits and pieces. And I was like, it's a, it's a lifestyle, mate. It's not just a six-week thing, you know, because as soon as you start eating again, if, or even if he eats one thing on a weekend, because he, st he still goes out and drinks and does this and that. I'm like... Yeah, like this, this is the thing. Like You've got to be committed. Yeah, that, the, the adjustment in the body... So, or in regard to the energy like development and stuff it just isn't there if you're going to then binge on the weekend so yeah probably good advice for that guy but but again it's an option and you will typically lose weight because you're cutting out an entire food group um, an example that i used previously when i went to like um, a local kind of uh, play area was i was doing carnivore at that time i was hungry the only thing available to, to buy was beige you know what I mean? It was like pastries and, and that type of stuff. So I just yeah. couldn't eat. Like yeah. I couldn't eat anything. Whereas if I was flexible dieting, I would have probably had a bad, something that wouldn't have filled me up, you know, and it, I would have eaten probably over my, my sort of restricted amount. That was the argument that we were saying when we were on carnival in bits and pieces. It's like, does it work or are we just restrict our calories? You know, I, I didn't, I, I, I wasn't tracking my calories. I was just eating meat, like what they say to do and this and that. But realistically, when I was losing weight, it it was I, in my opinion, it was probably just from restriction of calories because uh, again there would be times where you just couldn't eat. If you wanted to be real strict with it, you just couldn't eat because you're out and about. You can't. It's, there's very few things you can get from a fucking petrol station that can that can that yeah. you can eat. Yeah, I agree, mate. I think I was exactly the same as well. But of, of course, like we said, like protein is very satiating. So if you're eating a lot of protein as well, then you're going to feel fuller. So that helps. And then finally, you've got obviously the eating windows and the fasting. Now, a lot of people talk about the kind of, um, the kind of, uh, the benefits of fasting in relation to like cancer and that type of thing. Um, and that's, that's definitely for a different day. Um, but in regard to, again, overall calorie restriction, because you're closing the window in which you can eat, typically you're going to eat less. So it can work in respect to, to losing, you know, weight through calorie restriction. So they're your free, they're your free methods, really, mate. But I think ultimately, you know, the way that I always look at dieting is like, it's like a sort of like finance. So you just go back from holiday. Um, when you thought about your holiday, you probably went right. Well, let's think about how much it's going to cost. So how much, it's almost like finance in reverse, right? So with a holiday, you go, right, I want to go somewhere. How much does it cost? How much am I going to have to expend to, to be able to afford to pay for this, right? Okay. So to afford that, what I'm now going to do is I'm going to do like a bit of an analysis of my finances. So I'm going to look at the things that I'm spending and I'm going to go, what, what, what do I not need to spend? So don't need to, to gym like uh, memberships don't need Netflix and Amazon Prime, for example. So you start cutting things out. So you start reducing your expenditure. And then you go, well, well how else can I earn some money? I'll pick up some overtime, do a side hustle, take a second job on. And then eventually you start increasing your wealth and you finally get to the amount that you want to get to to be able to pay for your holiday. And dieting is like the opposite of that. So you go, I need to get to a weight, which is lower than I'm at currently. So you do a review of your diet, like you do your finances, but instead of going, what things am I spending? You go, what things am I consuming that I don't need to consume? And then you basically just cut those things out. And that's typically like just small adjustments, like switching full sugar Coke to Diet Coke, uh, not having 
two bottles of wine in a week, just having one. It's those sort of things. And then instead of picking up overtime to earn more money, you do then more exercise. So what extra activity can I do to expend energy? What restrictions can I put in to reduce my expenditure? And then you gradually lose weight and basically get to your target weight. So it's the same thing as saving for a holiday just in reverse. Yeah, mate, that makes perfect sense. Makes absolutely perfect sense. And um, yeah, I think on that, mate, we'll wrap it up because that was a good little analogy. Awesome. Cheers, mate. Next time. Cheers, buddy.